Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. And uh, I found out a long time ago that it's easier for people to try to put us all into uh, one box and say this is how you believe God or this is how faith works. And even though there are some scriptures that are non-negotiable, uh, the fact is, is that you are uniquely wired by God and he knows exactly how to get into your heart and how to get you moving forward in your future. Now, my learning style is visual. Uh, but years ago when I was in school, uh, I got terrible grades because most of the time the teachers would only talk to me and they would not engage me. They would not let me touch anything. They would not put things up on the screen. Uh, we had a, a day uh, that happened like once a semester we called audiovisual, where they would actually bring in a, a projector and show you something. And I was always very excited by seeing the Civil War, but I don't really want to hear you talk to me about the politics of the Civil War, or the other elements that made me go to sleep and get a bad grade. So my primary calling is for teaching, and I have a philosophy that teachers, or excuse me, that students don't fail, teachers fail. Because I believe every student is wired to learn, and I believe that if you can get into the heart of your student in the way that he was designed to learn, you can captivate him and pull them into brilliance, right? But some teachers, they don't know how to do that, or maybe they just get lazy because they do it year after year after year after year and they don't care about the kids anymore well God cares about his kids right so he's going to minister to you in your learning style in a ways that will keep you inspired about the things that God has told you so I want to talk about vision I want to talk to you about a revelation that God gave me some time ago uh, that really thrilled me you know, I've always been, I had a passion for the Word of God. I don't think I've ever had a season in my life in 30 years of being a believer where I didn't enjoy reading the Word or want to sit down and read the Word. I was ec extremely frustrated when circumstances kept me out of the Word. Um, I had to struggle and fight and reach for the measure of prayer life that God would want for me. But the Word has always been a great joy. I think that is something unique in all of us. If we divided the people up in this room and said, half of you are passionate about reading and learning, and those of you that are passionate about praying and interceding, we'd probably have half of you over there and half of you over there. The reason is, is because the, do the devil doesn't care if you become a theologian as long as you don't pray. And he doesn't care if you pray as long as you don't learn how to pray, <laughs> right? And then you're just shooting shotgun prayers up into the air, hoping something, something sticks, right? But when prayer and wisdom come together, the devil is afraid, right? So I love the word and I press towards prayer. But as you read the word and you understand the power and privilege of prayer, you become excited about that as well. So I grew up word of faith, um, was in a word of faith church, and I love the word of faith. Uh, I love the message of it. I love uh, the teaching on confession. I love all of the elements of it. Uh, I embrace it. Uh, I have pastors who are very dear to me, who are still died in the wool, word of faith preachers. I grew up cutting my teeth in Brother Copeland's sermons and uh, still love to hear him preach. And uh, here's a man, apart from the attack that he gets from religious community, in my opinion, has maintained uh, uh, integrity throughout the years. And anybody that can live that long and look so good still and be able to preach is doing something right, right? right. So I look to him as a voice from God. But I also learned that there's a whole lot of teaching that fell outside the paradigm of the Word of Faith teaching. And uh, I believe the body of Christ is beginning to come together now and compare notes, and we're all growing in different ways. But in Word of Faith, I learned that it's very important to maintain a good confession, that life and death were in the power of the tongue, and whatever you use your tongue for, that's what you're going to eat sooner or later. Uh, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. So I always 
basically said what I believe God wanted me to say. And when I struggled or said something that was amiss, I tried to repent, get back straight with God. Uh, but it's a war to keep your tongue right sometimes. And uh, the enemy is constantly uh, trying to get you to say something that digs up your seed or undermines your faith. And so uh, I'm good at that. I mean, when I, when, when I was in my prime in, that, in, those, in those circles, nobody ever said they were sick, right? Uh, you know, the, the most you, but you, you know, you wanted somebody to say, well, you, let, me, let me lay hands on you and pray for a second. So we would always say, say how are you doing? Well, I'm blessed, sanctified, uh, but I'm catching a healing, right? That's the only way we would let somebody know that I'm dying here, right? And, uh, and they go, well, let me pray for you, right? So we would just say, I'm catching a healing, right? And then, of course, we'd pray the word. Uh, so when I started getting prophetic words about my future, when God began to talk to me about my future, uh, I understood that it was very important to transcribe prophecies if you get them. And if you don't have prophecies, well, then get some books from Charles Caps and start copying all of the promises on healing and finances and everything. Type them out. Put them in a book and open them up and begin to speak and decree and declare the things that God has promised. Because if you be in Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the same promises. You know, if you go back in the book of Genesis uh, and read about the life of Abraham, uh, I found out that I was heir according to all of the promises of God and that Abraham was the father of faith. If I'm in Christ, because he's the seed, Right. I thought, well, you know, there's a few promises in there I need to dig out and write in a book. No, there are 50 promises, 50 things that God said Abraham could have. When I saw that, I got excited. I wrote them out, put them in a book. I speak them all the time. And then all the promises for the righteous. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, made us the righteousness of God in him. Therefore, God hears my prayers because he hears the prayers of the righteous, right? So you need to begin to create uh, books with confessions and declarations. So I had that speaking them for a long time, but it just seems like there was a lot of areas where I would just hit the wall. Like I couldn't push through into the place that God had promised me uh, just with my tongue, if that makes sense. Now, again, life and death, power of the tongue. Heaven and earth were created with let there be light, right? So we know the tongue is very, very important. But then I saw some things in the scriptures when I was meditating because the Bible said that we should walk the same steps as our father Abraham in regards to how he operated in faith. So if you'd put up uh, scripture in Romans for me. Okay, we know that Abraham was old and that Sarah was barren and that uh, God engaged Abraham. He was looking for a man in the earth. And he came and he met Abraham because in some areas of his life, he was, his name meant, Abram meant exalted father. Uh, he had one that was born in his house that wasn't from his seed that he was going to make an heir of all the stuff that he had. I think he was a good steward over finances and took care of, of his people. God finds him and decides to enter into a blood covenant with him, which is unheard of in that day. Covenants, blood covenants were between men, but for God to enter into covenant with a man, it's like, why would God need to do that? He doesn't lie. Covenants are sort of safety nets for people's agreement with one another. And so he says, I'm going to, Sarah's going to have a child and it's going to be from your seed. And he's going to be the father of many nations. Now, Abraham hears this from God and he, and he questions God and says, how shall I know? And he said, well, go get me a heifer and split it down the middle, which was an invitation to a blood covenant. So he must have been shocked that God, who never lies, for the sake of the weakness of his faith, would walk out that ceremony with him so that there'd be blood between them and that would be the end of all doubt for him. It became an anchor for his soul. Now I'm going somewhere. But after he does that, he says, behold the stars so shall thy seed be. And he talks to him about a promised land and everything, and he paints a picture of his future that goes beyond words. And this is where I want to read this verse here. Because of the covenant and because of the promise of God, it said that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, 
but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Well, the first thing he believed for was right standing with God. But there are, there are a lot of things that go along with that. But what I want to draw your attention to, and this is what caught me when I was meditating on it years ago, it said, and Abraham became fully persuaded. Well, I've learned a long time ago that a lot of times translations take you away from the true meaning. So I went into the Strong's Concordance to look up full persuasion. And I was happy and shocked to see that in one aspect of the definition, because in Hebrews there's various uh, colors of meaning, it said to know something in every possible way. And I thought, wow. And then God began to deal with me about that, and I was holding that in my spirit. A short time after that, I was in a meeting somewhere. I don't remember who was preaching at the time. Uh, it was good, and I was listening, and, and, uh, but there was a lot of stuff that was being said that I'd heard before, so it was one of those things where you can listen and read your Bible at the same time kind of message, you know. Uh, excuse me. And uh, then all of a sudden he said something that I had heard probably 15, 20 times before. You know, we hear preachers, they, they hear somebody say something that sounds deep, and so they say it all the time in their message and everything, and it's good. And it reminds us it's a principle, it's true. But, you know, sometimes you hear it so much, like, you know, and you just move along, move along. And, uh, but it was weird. I'd heard this statement so many times, and it never really impacted me on a spiritual level, but I appreciated it because it was witty, right? But this time, the guy said the same, what I consider to be a platitude at this time, and it went off in my spirit. And I learned something from that. You know, we can share the word of God, or we could talk the wisdom of God, but if but in order for it to impact the individual that we're speaking to, or our listener, God has to breathe on it, right? And it becomes a rhema for us in that moment, and not a logos, right? So God breathed on this statement, and, and, and it got my attention. I knew God was drawing my attention to this statement and wanting me to write in my journal. And it's a statement uh, by Mur Mike Murdoch. And, and I love his wisdom school and everything. And it was, it's this. And most of you probably heard it. If you want something you've never had, you got to do something you've never done. Right? And, and it went off in my spirit as if it was the voice of the Lord. I said, Lord, what are you telling me? And then God began to open up a can of understanding for me and reminded me that I was a visual learner. And that I was confessing promises that I couldn't see in my spirit, right? And uh, Mike Murdoch even says, if, if you have a dream and you can't see it, you'll never have it, right? So God began to show me that we need to paint a picture of our dream. And I said, well, Lord, this, I need to see some scriptures, right? So then I turned over to probably the most popular vision verse uh, in the Bible, which is Habakkuk 2.2. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, write the vision and make it plain. Do you ever notice that? Okay. Is he being redundant or is there a shift of emphasis on making it plain? Well, I took it in my spirit as I'm not only supposed to write it and say it, but I'm supposed to utilize my creativity to make plain what God is telling me in words so that I could receive it uh, in a full spectrum way. Does that make sense? Okay. So the other thing is remember when we're confessing things, uh, just like the revelation of if you want something you've never done, you got to do something. If you want something you never had, you got to do something you never done. If God doesn't breathe on the word, then the word is like shooting blanks, right? So one of the things I noticed I was doing is I was memorizing and committing verses to memory and saying, well, you know, my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that would rise up against me, I shall condemn, prove to be in the very world. And I would go on and on and on and on. But I didn't start that session of confession with intercession, right? So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to pray in the Holy Ghost. 
was to pray in our understanding, and we're supposed to charge the environment with the very presence of God. Then when we start confessing the scripture, we're, we're loading our gun up. You understand? I'll show you this in a way that I just saw this afternoon. If you go over to the book of Genesis, everybody points to the fact that, well, you know, we're creating the image of God. And, and Jesus has a sword in his mouth. It's the sword of the spirit. And he has your spirit inside of you. And your mouth is the sword of the spirit. And when you shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and all that is true, right? But when you look and go back to Genesis where God said, let there be light, he did not say, let there be light until the universe was charged by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit hovered over chaos. And God said, let there be light. Okay, We don't know how long the Holy Spirit hovered. Right? And if you look up the word hovered in Hebrew, it means to flutter. It means to vibrate. But it also means to brood. And brood means to incubate. It means to meditate. It actually means to groan and mourn for the condition that you're praying over. Right? So imagine you go somewhere, you go to Africa, you see people and they're starving to death. You take Heidi Baker, she's in Africa, she sees children everywhere starving to death. She doesn't just start teaching or confessing. She begins to weep. Her heart begins to break. She, be she groans within herself with compassion in regard to the condition of these children. And the Holy Ghost falls on her because of this groaning. And then God gives her the prophetic declarations that she needs to say in order to change the circumstances. So we can't just theologically walk into a situation and expect the logos to change the situation. Your groaning and intercession coupled with the leading of the Holy Spirit and the words he gives you to speak are powerful and change circumstances. So right when God was giving me these revelations, he uh, leads me. Well, I believe he led me because I got revelation from it. But I was reading a National Geographic magazine. And I was flipping through it. And all of a sudden I saw a, a, an MRI of a human brain. And they were talking about the different areas of your brain that fire when you are operating in different senses. So what you see fires back here. And they showed the light on the MRI when the person was looking at something. And then there's an area that fires when you speak. There's an area that fires when you smell. There's an area that fires when you hear. And there's an area that fires when you touch. And God began to talk to me about that and said, Abraham was fully persuaded that what I promised him, he, I was able to perform because I said, behold, the stars <laughs> fired back here, right? And then he said, I want you to walk through the land. I want you to walk through the breadth and the width because I'm giving it to you. He saw everything. He probably ate the fruit. He tasted it. He smelled his land, his promised land. He experienced it. When God said, bring me a heifer, cut it down the middle, he walked through blood and entrails, and he cut covenant with a pillar of fire, and I'm sure that he could smell it. I mean, God bombarded all of his sense gates with the promises that he gave him. And yet, we hold on to a verse or something, but it's not alive to us the way it was alive to Abraham. But we can make it alive, right? So what I did is I created a vision book, and I tried to make it full spectrum. Our spirit man and our brain should be in agreement our soul our mind will and emotion should be in agreement with the promises of God but how many people here have said my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory and look down on your desk at a stack of bills that high and your emotions were not in agreement with that confession right am I right okay 
So what do you need to do to get your emotions in agreement with what God has said? Right? You need to create something. Okay. So I realized what God was trying to tell me. God's covenant with Abraham had involved him hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, saying. He was fully engaged and became fully persuaded. Now I want to have a disclaimer here that's very, very important so that you understand. This is not the secret. This is not the law of attraction, right? Because what they do is they employ some of these same methodologies. But they don't want to be accountable to God. New Age ministries are, we're all spiritual beings. We all have a hunger for the supernatural, right? But spirituality without accountability to God is what they want. Because they want what they want instead of what God wants. I don't do any of these things unless I have received from God a prophetic direction or a promise in his word. So it's not the law of attraction. It's obedience to God that I would place the promise of God in, and bring and cause to sit in the threshold of every sense gate in my body to say yes and amen to what God has said. Now, I could be, I could be believing for finances and employing these principles. But one thing I've learned is that if finances come your way and you are in Christ, those finances are his inheritance, not mine. And when they come, the fear of God should come on me and think, wow, what a blessing, what a miracle, but is it mine? Or do you have a plan for it, Lord? Because you might just be a channel for the will of God. But if you submit to be a channel for the will of God, that channel will never close. You understand? Because what you make happen for other people, God will make happen for you. So, Sandra and I, we don't jump up and down when unexpected money comes until we find out God, what God really wants to do with it, right? People who are exercising the law of attraction only have themselves in mind, right? So, when it comes to believing God for stuff, motive is everything, right? If your motives are misplaced, Scripture says you ask not because you ha you have not because you ask not, or you ask wrongly, wanting to consume it upon your own lust. This is the safety net for believers that we don't get caught up in this law of attraction nonsense. You understand? Okay. Having said that, that's my disclaimer. I'm going to show you a lot of stuff that you would think, oh, you know, it looks like that, but it's not. Okay. <laughs> This is not the secret, not the law of attraction. This is about the whole man getting in agreement with what God has said, putting God's word at the threshold of all your sense gates. I don't know about you, but I don't want half of me saying amen and the other half going, me. well, I don't know. Right? I want all of me saying amen with whatever God says, right? Okay. Remember, where there's no, where there's no spirit, there's no power. So we must, first of all, pray to get the leading of the Lord. Intercession precedes declaration. Declaration precedes manifestation. Words without the spirit are like firing blanks. Okay, let's put up one of my images, the first image here. I wrote a curriculum on this called Word Guided, Im Word -guided Imagery. Ooh, I got a lot of flack from it. Everybody was like, ah, secret, secret. No, 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 no. That's why the disclaimer, I qualified it in advance. This is scriptural. I didn't say go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> it's word-guided imagery. Okay. No. Uh, so, yeah, we created a cover. Now, what I, what I did with this is I wanted to engage my vision, and the vision was of God, and in, involve all aspects of my being. Now, Yes, it's true that I'm a little technologically illiterate and not really that hot on a computer. Um, but in this case, it was the right thing to do. I went through some magazines with an X-Acto knife. I shared with you this once before and cut things out and overlaid them and then copied them and put them on a computer so that I could adjust them and that sort of thing. 
but this is multi layers of magazines and different things that were created. And I just had a graphics guy put the title over the top. Why did I do that? Because cutting it out connected me to the vision kinetically. You understand? I have some healing scriptures in my book that were healing scriptures and images from a child's coloring book of Jesus laying hands on people and them being healed. And I thought, ooh, I'm going to color that and make that mine, right? So I colored it really nice and everything and then put, you know, verses next to it and everything so that I could connect artistically, creatively, and kinetically with the promise of God. That's a little different than just typing out a scripture and confessing it, right? Next picture. Now, sometimes I put verses or promises or prophecies, but sometimes if I have certain scriptures committed to memory, I just put the imagery. So see on the left, I got a, I got a book on healing. With, it's got this explosion going off on a body with Jesus laying hands. That's, that's from two different books. And then another picture where Jesus is ministering the love of God to uh, Nicodemus. And there's a cross in the background with a serpent on the pole, which is another symbol of Jesus hanging a cross that brought redemption and healing for us. So I could look at that and say, Father, I thank you that Jesus was wounded for my transgressions, that he was bruised for my iniquities, that the chastisement that was needful for the obtaining of my peace and well-being was placed upon him and by his stripes I'm healed. Now I'm looking at an image of healing an image of the nature and character of Jesus to heal while I'm confessing the scriptures, right? Now, what if I did that every day while I was smelling some essential oil flavor of some kind, right? Now, I'm serious. Listen to me now. It's powerful, right? But I only smelled that sensation, that flavor, when I was confessing the healing scriptures, right? That's the, only, the rest of the time I put it away, don't smell it. Let's say I did that for six months every day, and then I put it away. Then one day the devil attacked my body. What effect do you think it would have on my spirit that I would run, open up that oil, and smell it? Don't you think all that would flood back into my spirit? Right? We can use our sense gates, our, our, our olfactory system, right? All of you probably had an experience like this. Okay. I mean, I had, I had a girlfriend back in, in, the, in, in 1980, right? And she's so far gone and past in my memory and in my history. And, uh, and partly because it was a long time ago and partly because I got something so much better, I don't need to look back no more, <laughs> right? However, I remember Christmas shopping at the mall one time years and years ago before I met Sandra. And I'm just walking through the mall, and it's so crowded, but somebody that I didn't even see walked past me. And then I, I smelled this smell, and all of a sudden, man, I was back in time. <laughs> I was wrapped up in the arms of Leona, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> right? What did that? Scent. Right? Maybe we can employ scent to build the scriptures into our spirit. Three wise men brought gifts to Jesus. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold represented holiness and purity and sanctification. But frankincense and myrrh, myrrh was what they used to baptize people with, or, or to, I should say, not baptize, but uh, embalm. They would wrap up the grave clothes and put it around there. So to it was part of a burial, so it represented baptism. And then frankincense represents prayers, prayers of the saints, right? These are three very powerful things. So they brought something expensive, and they brought worship, and, and they brought their death to the feet of the Savior. So there's a lot of types and shadows in there. Okay. Let's go to the next picture here and see what we got. Okay, I don't know about you, but I got in a situation once, and still in some instances, uh, was battling with a lot of debt, right? Uh, I wasn't always a good steward with my finances, and I still have opportunity from time to time, okay? I cut this out. I put, I put some bills on the bed where this guy is praying, and if you notice, I cut out a little book, and it's John Avendini's uh, War on Debt, Okay. And then on the other side, where Peter is down, drowning in the Sea of Galilee, uh, I surrounded him with bills. 
So I thought, well, if I'm ever drowning in a sea of debt, there's going to be Jesus, and he's going to grab my hand and pull me up out of there, right? So again, I've got scripture for that. Next picture, let's see what else we got. Okay, here's one that, I, that most of mine have done. Well, you've got confessions or you've got prophetic unction or words that were given you next to an image. Now, here's a picture of Jesus and the glory and all the angels. And then I, I superimposed a picture of Samuel, which was anointing David. But then I cut a little picture out there where the angels were. And I put my happy face in there. And so what you see is uh, I'm being anointed by God. And I've got all these scriptures about the anointing of God so I can see it and say it. You know, the formula for success is see, speak, and do, right? But you do by the leading of the Spirit, right? Because some things you can do and, and, and God didn't tell you to do it, right? But he told me to do this, right? Next picture. Let's see what else is here. Okay. Now, this is about connecting kinetically. I've got a, let me see what I got. Seven minutes. Okay. There was a prophet that I knew as a friend that's gone home to be with the Lord. His name was Dennis Tenorino. Great man. Very accurate prophet. He used to be Mr. Universe. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He led Arnold Schwarzenegger to the Lord. Praise God. So, um, I hadn't seen him for a long time. I knew him in the early days, and I didn't see him. And then somebody invited me to Porter Ranch for a home meeting. I walk in there, and there's Dennis. And Dennis calls me up, and he prophesies over me. And I'm not going to tell you the whole prophecy, but one thing he said, he said, I see a King Cyrus anointing in your life. He said, you have a King Cyrus anointing. He said, God's going to give you treasures in darkness. I hear the word treasure, treasure, treasure. What he didn't know at all because I hadn't seen him for so long, is that my new pastime was metal detecting. And I'm like, yes, treasure, treasure, right? And he said, God's going to show you where the gold is, and he's going to give you a plan on how to get it out. And, and, and you're going to be a blessing to other ministries that are struggling. In other words, you're going to help other ministries with the finances that God is going to bring to you. But he didn't say anything about metal detecting, but I don't think he had to after saying treasure three times, right? So what I did is I thought, well, you can't have it if you can't see it, right? So, you know, I got some movie props that were gold bars and sprayed them with gold paint. And Sandra and I went out to the beach and found a little beach cave. And she was taking pictures of me recovering gold because the prophetic word that came unto me is going to look like that in Jesus' name. Amen. And when I get weary of speaking or saying or discouraged Sometimes just the image will pull me up out of doubt. Amen. Next one. Okay. Now, Sandra, when I was putting this together, she thinks, oh, Tim, be careful. I said, what? She said, well, you're going to think that you're all about money. No, I, I'm not all about money. I'm about illustrating the prophetic words that have been given to me. And I have tons of these pictures and other pro pro prophetic words. But... I'm just using the one that Dennis give, gave me as an illustration. But to show you that Sandra and I, the primary thing, I mean, we love that song, Show Me Your Glory. We are seekers of the glory, right? Because anything is possible. You know, God said with, all, all, uh, with God, all things are possible. Well, that's true. But God's in the glory. So in the glory, all things are possible, right? And so uh, we're like, well, how do we illustrate, you know, walking in or receiving the glory of God? Well, I found this little ark-looking thing in a thrift store, and I brought it home and sprayed it gold. And Sandra and I, we put, like, some little mini christmas light things inside the box and everything, and I kind of shifted it around on a silk cloth and everything. We took a bunch of pictures of it, and we liked this one the best. But it looks like the Ark of the Covenant with the glory coming out. Um, I'm just hoping that my eyes don't melt in my face like in Indiana Jones. But <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Next picture because I'm running out of time here, but okay, there's my metal detector over my shoulder, and they're out in the woods there, and I made a big facsimile nugget there, because God's going to show me where the gold is, and going to give me a plan on how to get the gold out, amen? Right. Okay, next picture. All right, a lot of times we get out there, we're on old home sites, and we find relics and things like that, and here's an old tobacco tin, but I would love to find just for the tin, but occasionally there's catches, and old farmers that didn't trust banks and stuff, they would bury stuff, and this is like whole ton of Spanish silver right there. So next picture. 
And there's me finding it right there. Next picture. How about a, a, a strong box full of cash? That would be nice to find, right? Next picture. Here's Sandra getting ready to go to Whole Foods. <laughs> Next picture. Now, we went so far as to say we're going to be heroes in the metal detecting community. So there's a manual on a mock Western Easter Treasure magazine cover. Next picture. There's Sandra on a mock Western Eastern Trevor. Next picture. And there's me in the strong box right there. So we went the extra mile in our dream books, right? And we've got other things that we put together as well. But I've shared with you the principle about making your dreams come to life, right? You got to pray before you decree. Right? Charge your bedroom, your office with the presence and the power of God. Right? Then find the promises. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, then we have the petitions of him that we desire. Underscore his will. Right? Not everything we're believing for is going to be good for us. Right? So make sure that you can find the peace of God and the leading of God and the scriptures and the promises of God. Uh, the Bible says, believe God's prophets, so shall ye prosper, right? So prophecy matters, but try the Spirit to make sure that it's of God. Not, ever, not everybody that says, thus saith the Lord, is speaking for the Lord. So you need to know. Most of the time, you get a prophetic word, it'll confirm another word that you've received, or God will say something to you in prayer, and then somebody will come up and say, I believe God is saying this, and you go, oh my God, there it is, Right? In the testimony of two or more, every word shall be established. That's how you should embrace your prophetic words, right? Amen. And then, as Paul told Timothy, war a good warfare by the prophecies that have gone out over you because your sense gates are being bombarded every day by the devil's lies. Replace those lies with truths and get it up in your face, get it up in your nose, get it in your mouth, touch it, feel it. Kids grow faster from ages one and five and, and in the early years of their life than they do when they're adults because they do show and tell. They show it, they tell it, they taste it, they touch it. Why are kids always putting stuff in their mouth? It's another way to learn what it is, right? I'm not saying that we should put a bunch of stuff in our mouth, but, but uh, I taught a lesson for kids once and had them eat Bible honey and they never forgot the lesson, right? Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.